So everyone, my name is Chris Swataka, and I lead uh, a few different ministries, LaborDaySingles.org, uh, which is where this is coming from, our live Facebook page. Uh, also, Chris Swataka Ministries, the Singles Network, and Intentional Relationship Solutions. And so uh, please give me a shout out. Let me see if I'm coming through live there. There we go. Um, I see that I'm actually live on the page now, which is good. And uh, don't you love technology? I just love technology. And so let's see. Here we go. Thanks for, uh, on my end, it says I'm still not starting, but I look on my phone and it looks like that I am uh, live. So thanks again for joining. So let me go back and start over. We were talking about discernment. We were talking about Proverbs. And so uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, books of the Bible is Proverbs because of the wisdom about daily life in this book. And so we're going to be primarily focused on Proverbs 22, 1 through 14. The author of Proverbs is Solomon. And what I love about uh, Solomon is that he, in a dream that he had, he prayed, he talked to God about wanting wisdom. Basically, he says, I want a discerning heart. Uh, in the ESV, it says that he was asking for an understanding mind to lead the people. And so what I love about this, this is in 1 Kings 3, 3 through 15. What I love about this is that we can also pray for the same thing. We can also pray for a discerning heart. In James 1, 5, God says that we can, uh, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without approach, and it will be given him. Would you consider yourself to be wise? Would you consider yourself to have a discerning heart? Do you, like, do you have insight to help others? Put in the chat, what about, would you say that you have wisdom? Um, I appreciate it. There you go. Hey, Sherry. Uh, hopefully I'm back. And uh, so, um, you know, I would say that one of my spiritual gifts is discernment. Um, I can easily give advice and direction to others based on what God's word says, what my own life experience, the other people that I know, their life experience. But I'll be honest with you, I don't always have personal discernment for myself. Um, I have blind spots. I have things I don't always see. That's why it's so important that we have friends and people that are wise in our lives. Um, in my Bible study that I co-authored with Pastor Dan Houck, Intentional Relationships, we talk about this because uh, we want all of our relationships to be healthy. We want a family, work, uh, friends, romance, all of that, marriages, all of it to be healthy. And one of the chapters is on blind spots because often we don't see certain things about our own lives. We may be quick to tell somebody else about theirs, but do we have discernment for our own lives? I love that we can ask God to have better wisdom, better understanding so that we can lead, we can pastor, we can minister, we can disciple, but we also need to be praying and asking God for us to see things in our own lives that we don't see. So Proverbs is a, uh, a book of the Bible that is full of great advice um, and direction on how to live. Um, the key, the key is do you follow what you hear? My pastor this morning talked about how hearing the word and doing nothing never changes anyone. So let's get started. You got your Bible ready? We're going to be, like I said, in chapter 22. We're going to try to get through all the verses of 1 through 14 uh, with our limited time. We'll probably go over a little bit due to the little technical difficulties. So hopefully you're still watching, and I do appreciate that too. Let me just double check right quick and see where we are. And uh, hey, Pastor Freddie. Oh, you're watching. Hey, Freddie, I want to let you know I have this mug that you gave me about how, you know, I'm, I have to ask for forgiveness before I, you know, had my coffee. So appreciate that, Pastor Freddie. So verse one says, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. A good name, your reputation is more important to God than what you could have ever owned. How you live your life, how you spend your money, your time, your talents, the use of your spiritual gifts, how you treat others, including your family, your friends, those you work with, your neighbors, and even though pe those people you don't like, mm -hmm, even those people you don't agree with, even those people who believe differently than you, 
Um, I'm going to just tell you, you will never bring anyone to Christ through anger. You will never bring anyone through Christ through hate. So based on how you live your life shows who you're following. And he's talking about this. So who are you following today? Are you following uh, social media, uh, a certain person you worship, an, a musician or an actor or a politician, uh, your checkbook, uh, um, your stomach? I'm just, uh -huh. So he's saying, hey, you know, the reality is, what kind of reputation do you have? How do, what do people say about you? Do they say that you're a person that's following God? You're a person that is living a life uh, bearing fruit? Or would they say something else about you? Verse 2 goes on to say, Rich and poor have this in common. The Lord is maker of them all. So you come into this world with nothing and you leave with nothing. I mean, as far as my understanding, you're naked either way, right? I mean, you go in, you ain't got nothing. You go before the Lord by yourself. So no matter how many possessions, no matter how much Gucci or Dior you, you own, it will make any difference. The Lord is the same for all of us, whether you're a sinner or saved by grace. Um, I go to the UK every year, do ministry there. And the, the queen, of course, died last year. I was there uh, when she died. I was there when, when she had the funeral. It was amazing. And I've always admired the queen because of her faith in the Lord. But the, the country of England, um, they, re, they, they really love their king and queen. They love their royalty. And so I did a little bit of research on that. And, you know, like, uh, I wanted to know who, who created the fur, like, who decided they were the king of England? You know, where did that come from? And please correct me if I'm wrong for my British friends, but it was King Alfred in 871 AD became a self-appointed king. Here's the thing. You know what? I, I realize royalty is important and there's, and there's some fun and, and all that kind of stuff. But, but they're no more valuable to God than you are, than I am. God is the one who gives favor. God is the one who appoints. God is the one who equips. And all of this is for his purpose, for his kingdom. And so while uh, some have proven uh, better at, 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 at being responsible for money, and responsible for things or having a big company or a big home or whatever, um, it doesn't change who God is to all of us. He created us all. Verse 3 talks about the prudent. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. When my uh, nieces and nephews were getting their driver's license for the first time, I just have a little bit of advice. I said, look, Assume that every person, every single person that's driving is out to jump in front of you. Every single person is going to slam on brakes. Every single person is going to merge without putting on their blinker. Every single person is out to probably have a wreck. And the whole point of this was they needed to drive defensively. They needed to drive with the understanding that this could happen so they would drive more effectively. And so... Because, you know, the reality is driving a car, you're driving this big hunk of metal and plastic and whatever going down a highway at 60, 70 miles an hour. Wow. And a lot of things can happen. Potholes and deers come out in front and crazy people falling asleep and texting on their phones. All kinds of crazy things can happen. And so the Lord says, hey, the prudent see danger and they take refuge. They're smart, right? But the simple keep going to pay the penalty. God is saying that people who are prudent those who see the possibilities of things that could harm you, your family or harm your ministry or harm your business, they do what's necessary to avoid it. They plan, they prepare. And if you're in Oklahoma City or on the Florida coast, you take shelter. Because guess what? They get hurricanes, they get tornadoes. I live in North Carolina. We occasionally get a hurricane, get a tornado. Alabama, tornadoes. Texas, tornadoes. It happens. So because you know this kind of danger can happen, you have shelters, you have uh, basements, you have, you have a plan. Because that's what the prudent do. They know the dangers around us. They know the danger that can happen to our families and our ministries and our businesses. And so they plan ahead. Verse 4 talks about humility. Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. Humility is a fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor life. Would you consider yourself humble? I mean, people call you humble. Wow. 
you know, Freddie is such a humble man. Sherry is such a humble, humble woman. Um, I'm going to tell you something. If you start praying for humility, just like you're praying for patience, um, you know what God's going to do, right? He's going to put you in the situation to make you more humble. He's going to put you in the situation to show you patience and the need of patience. So be aware, you know, God does not like pride. We know how much he dislikes pride because pride is saying, I don't need God. I'm good. I can do it on my own. I do not need God to help me. Really? Be careful with those words if you say that to God. Be careful if you're living your life as if you are, you know, you're good on your own and you don't need God to help you. Be very, very careful. Uh, it is not all on you. It never has been. Whether you're watching this saved, whether you're watching this lost, it is not on you. God is still God. I promise you, no one gets to the end of their life without the help of others, no matter how successful you are. At our Labor Day retreat that we have over Labor Day, Big Singles Retreat, we have a team of people. There's no way that Pastor Freddie and myself could lead this ministry of this retreat without the help of everyone else. Not only the, the leadership, but also those who serve under the leadership, all the volunteers, the facility, all the people praying throughout the year, the people who financially support it, the sponsors. Do you realize that it takes all of that for it to happen? You can't go through this life thinking it's on you, you, it's all about you, it's what you've accomplished and what you've done. Well, tell you what, God will knock you down. You don't want him to knock you down. Get you off of your pedestal. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt, sweat socks, backpack, okay? A part of having humility is to know and say that you don't know it all. Someone else might have a better way. Um, no matter how, I mean, Someone else may have a better way. Asking for help and knowing when to shut your mouth. Yeah, that's a tough one sometimes because you feel like you need to say something. You feel like you need to have an opinion or insight. And practicing to... <laughs> teaches us humility. Verse 5 says, In the path of the wicked are snares and pitfalls, but those who would preserve their life stay far from them. When I was a little girl, my mom really uh, somewhat controlled my friends. Like, she really didn't like me playing with certain little girls and other little girls she's like, you can play with. And I didn't know why. It's because some of these little girls, she knew enough about them to know that they would lead me down a wrong path. Um, I didn't understand it at the time, um, but I, I look back and I can see what my mom was protecting me from, right? And God is telling us the same thing. It's one thing to know someone uh, who's lost or someone who's going down the wrong path and you're trying to help them towards Christ. But it's another to end up being around them because eventually they're going to pull you back into that old world. They're going to pull you back into where they are. It's much easier to pull someone down um, off, of a, uh, off of where they are in Christ, elevated, than it is to pull somebody up. So you have to be very careful of who you're around and who you associate with and who you spend your time with. Um, we need to be in this world and we need to be leading people to Christ and we need to be in places where some of those people might be. I get that. I understand that. Um, but be very careful for yourself, especially if you struggle or have struggled in some of those areas and you can easily fall back into that old sin. Um, Pastor Freddie knows he's shared his, his, uh, his um, salvation story many times of being saved in a bar. Um, I got saved after three days of literally uh, coming out of being drunk and um, having uh, alcohol poisoning and having no memory of where, how I got home. Um, and I, same thing, very similar story and got saved as well. And so um, I don't want to fall back into that. You know, some of you know that I'm like, I don't drink, I don't want to drink, don't want to be around drinking, would never date a man who drinks. Because I have that history from when I was young. And I don't want to go back there. I don't want to be tempted. I don't want to fall back. I don't, it's not, oh, you can just have a social, like at one little glass of wine or one a little, little you, know, gla you know, glass of beer. And For some of you, it's, you do it, you don't feel nothing maybe. For me, it will, I could, just like this, I bet you I could go back. So I'm not going to take the risk. I'm going to be smart. God wants you to have a long life. The life he, he's given you. 
Um, and the one way for it not to be a long life is to go back into that old lifestyle where it is dangerous and easily could throw you in the pit. You could easily lose your life. Um, verse 6 talks about starting children off the all it says start children off on the way they should go and even when they are old they will not return of it the ESV says train up a child train up a child we know this verse well right I love this because it says it gives I would believe gives us hope gives people hope who have prodigal children who have a prodigal son or daughter, that they gave them the word growing up. They taught them the right word. My mom says, hey, I taught you right from wrong. You turn 18, you're on your own, right? Don't be blaming me, right? And it's true. You know, here's the thing. The importance of this proverb is it reminds us of the importance of raising children to love Jesus, raising kids to know right from wrong, teaching them God's word, and leading them to Christ. Because here's the thing, down the road, if they start to go on their own path, if they start to, you know, get independent and get on their own, they get to college, they, you know, they stop going to church, all these things, the word is there and it will come back. Now, I wouldn't want to see any child to have to go through anything that I went through as a young adult. I wouldn't want any of you watching to, to have your children or grandchildren have to go down the path and learn the hard way. But if the word is there, it will come back. In John 14, 26, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I've said to you. So keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Trust the Lord for that. And you know what? Even if you're not a parent, you're an aunt, you're an uncle, you're a cousin, you're a neighbor, you're a friend, you're a Sunday school teacher, you're a small group teacher, youth teacher, you have influence on children. So keep doing what you're doing. God knows people have choices. They're easily influenced by those around them, but the truth is inside them and the Holy Spirit can bring it back. Verse seven talks about the rich rule over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. God's not saying don't go borrow money for a house or borrow money for a car. He's just simply saying until it's paid off, right? Until it's paid off, you're under that lender. And depending on how much interest rate it is you're paying, some people never pay it off. They stay in the negative equity. They never can seem to get ahead. And then sometimes their vehicles get repossessed. Sometimes they have to foreclose on their home or, or file bankruptcy. So be careful. Be wise when you decide to borrow. Get the advice of someone you trust. Look at the interest rates. Be smart. Maybe save up a little bit longer and keep taking the bus, right? After my last car was paid off years ago, I remember putting money in the bank. I continue to put uh, part of the of the money I was paying for my car into the bank. It was going to be for the next car. So I could put a bigger deposit down so that my payments would be smaller. Now, if the car lasted long enough, I could get the entire cost of a new car, but it wasn't that way. But when it came time to buy a new car, I was able to put enough down to where my payments are so low, they're very affordable. And here's the thing. I don't have any other debt. And there's freedom in that because you're not under anybody else. There is freedom and flexibility to be used by God. So, hey, check out Dave Ramsey or Crown Financial and do what you got to do to get your finances in order so you can do more for God. I know Pastor Freddie is a big budget guy and he has done amazing things at his church. And when he got there, the debt was high and now the debt is way low. And, and it's because they made decisions. They cut back. They made adjustments. They made changes. And maybe that's what you have to do in your life. Verse 8 says, Whoever sows injustice reaches calamity, and the rod they wield in fury will be broken. Not fury, but fury. <laughs> During COVID and after, have, have you heard the word Karens and Kevins? People who like to just stir up stuff. They like to cause argument. Now, during COVID, it was really stressful. And people having to wear the mask. And I don't want to wear the mask. And I, you're, my rights are I shouldn't have to wear the mask. And oh, oh, oh. Well, all COVID stressed everybody out, guys. You know that, right? And it's still stressing people out. There's still stuff that's going on. And there's still residual effects, ripples from all of that. Because every time you turn around, there's a new disease. There's a new financial crisis. There's a new this. There's a new that. And all it does is keep us stirred like this, right? And it just, it's just, it's just tough. It's just tough, right? Um, we've seen police uh, take advantage of people, but we've also seen people take advantage of the police. God is not going to stand for those who go around attacking others. 
God is also not going to stand for the injustices that are happening to the people. He says vengeance is his. He wins in the end. The prince of this world, the, the enemy, he's on a short, short rope. God is going to break it. Verse 9 says the generous will themselves be blessed for they share the food with the poor. Now, recently, a friend of mine was complaining to me, and she said, you know, Chris, um, she was having a move, and she says, you know, uh, I thought in verse, you know, in Acts, it talks about the, the church, the new church, uh, the first church in Acts, where everybody sold everything and gave, and nobody had, uh, you know, nobody had a want or a need. If you had extra food, you gave it away. If you had extra coats, you gave it away. If you had a place near an extra bed, you people came and stayed, and she was frustrated because she felt like people as Christians were not doing this. Um, but you know what? I, I understood her, but I felt the people are, but in other ways. Um, I mentioned last week that a lady gave me and some of my friends a ton of clothes and a ton of shoes. That is this verse to me. That is, you know, I love how they blessed me and God is going to bless them. Um, I also talked about, uh, uh, recently I posted on uh, one of the Facebook pages that a friend of mine from Tennessee was going to be in town and she needed a place to stay for about three days. And uh, I only have two bedrooms and some of you know my mom and I uh, live here. And so I didn't have an extra bedroom for her so she could have some privacy. But I posted on Facebook and right away we had like four people respond. And that to me is this verse. People are sharing their homes. Um, when I was sick recently, my Sunday school teacher said, I'll bring you some food. And recently my brother's recovering from quadruple bypass. And I've seen amazing generosity in people helping him. Thank you. Thank you to those of you who give. God says you're going to be blessed. Thank you for a giving heart, opening up your homes, giving food, giving money, giving time, giving resources. Verse 10 says, drive out the mocker. And out goes strife. Mm -hmm. Quarrels and insults are ended. God is talking about those who want to divide. Those people that have toxic behavior. They're in our churches, they're in our communities, they're in our families. Um, recently, a friend of mine said she would not go on vacation with her family. She says it would be absolute nightmare because I know when we go, there's going to be fights. There's going to be quarreling. So she says, I'm just not going. We have to grow stronger in our relationship with God. We have to develop better boundaries. We have to choose to say nothing or walk away. Don't let these people in your life if they are affecting your walk with God. You keep quoting scripture. You keep praying. And I promise you, they're either going to be drawn to the spirit or they're going to leave. Verse 11 says, one who loves a pure heart and who speaks with grace will have the king for a friend. God is telling us the importance of a good attitude. To speak appropriately with others and to value them. Um, I would have to say that I've not always had a good attitude. How about you? I've done my share of complaining and whining. And, you know, what do you complain about? What are some of the things that drive you nuts that you complain about? God reminds us of the importance of what we say and how we say it. It's what you are able to say going to build a kingdom or is it going to tear it down? Will it help someone or hurt them? Is it about you or is it about God? Wow. You know, I love the book of James. And it's like, you know, you open up the book of James and there's my picture right there, right? And I wish I could get back all the things that I've ever said that I wish I didn't say or the things I've said in anger, the things I've said in um, just stupidity, the things I've said in, you know, just bad jokes and you know and recently somebody said something about me that uh they wish they could have pulled it right back in they made it as a joke and said it out loud and then realized what they said and then they spend the next few minutes apologizing to me and and apologizing and apologizing and you know what it did it didn't really bother me what they said but what it what it did is it made me feel wow i'm not the only one that says stupid things i'm not the only one that wishes they could pull it back in right this is something, this is wise advice, right? To speak with grace, to love people, to care about people, to think about what we say before we say it. Wow. Verse 12 says, The eyes of the Lord keep watch over knowledge, but he frustrates the words of the unfaithful. 
God is watching over all of us. He's omnipresent, which means he's always present. And he's omni, om, omnipotent. I'm going to say that word wrong. He's all knowing. We just say that he's all knowing. He is watching over our words as well as our actions. He is also over the unfaithful. By teaching us the truth, we can easily discern the enemy's tactics. We can easily discern the lies. We can easily discern truth from those lies and not allow those who have no faith to affect, to have and, and have any effectiveness, effectiveness on those who do. I love that about the Lord. Verse 13 says, the sluggard says, there's a lion outside. I'd be killed in the public square. This is one of my biggest aggravations and probably complaints is lazy people. They don't want to work. They think they're entitled. They want to stand on the street corner begging for money. Some of them make more money than I do by doing that. You can't discern the ones that really need the help from the ones who don't. The ones that are, you know, crooks, right? They want to have baby after baby after baby and collect welfare or benefits. They want the government to pay for everything. They collect disability when they can clearly work. And just like this person in this, what is talking about in the scripture, they make excuses on why they can't work. I'm grateful to my mom who taught me and my siblings a high work ethic. All of us have worked. I've had a job since I was eight years old. And you know what, here's the thing, even if you're retired or on disability, you can still work by serving the Lord. Thank you for those of you who do. I know people ain't got a legs and they're still serving God. I know people who can't speak, but they're typing messages and encouraging. People that are old and can't drive anymore, but yet they're writing cards. We can always work for the Lord. But just sit there and hold your hand out like you're entitled, that you, you're special. When you need to get off your hiney, and do something for God. Stop expecting everybody to give you something. And God talks about it. He does not like lazy people. Get off that couch. Get back in church and serve the Lord. And finally, verse 14. The mouth of the adulterous woman is a deep pit. A man who is under the Lord's wrath falls into it. Solomon knew the danger of people who used Words, actions to pull you into their pit of deception, of lies, of sin. He's seen it with his own father who fell morally. Talking about David. God isn't just picking on women, but he's reminding us how easily it, can, it is to fall into adultery. It starts with a wife or a husband who doesn't understand me. That leads to longer lunches and after work meetings, a touch, a hug. Whether you're single or married, you can easily fall into a sexual relationship outside your marriage and outside the will of God. This is just, this is just giving us an idea, a concept of understanding that it happens in all areas. Food, drugs, stuff, one cupcake, one hydrocoding that you don't need, right? One more this or that doesn't seem to hurt, but leads to the next and the next and the next. Solomon reminds us of the power this world has on us. The enemy knows our weaknesses. He knows our struggles. We have to be very aware of what the enemy's doing. The goal of the enemy is to destroy you, to kill you, to take things away from you, to take everything away from you that you've ever loved, to take your voice away, your, your witness away, your reputation away, your wisdom away, right? Put you back into that pit, back into those places where you eventually will kill you. But Christ came to give you life and you don't know Christ, you can accept him right now. All you have to do is believe that Jesus died on the cross for you because you're a sinner and say, I'm a sinner. Ask the Lord into your heart. Say, I want to follow you. I don't, I need your help. I, I don't have any humility. I mean, I mean, all I have is humility. I know I need a savior to save me. Or maybe you're listening to this and you're saying, Chris, I need to be more wise in my life. I need to be like Solomon. I need to be better at being a leader, better at being a dad or a mom or a grandparent, better at being a friend. I need to have that wisdom. Or maybe I need to choose some better friends. Maybe I need to, you know, stop whining and complaining about what I haven't gotten from our government and start saying, what can I do? How can I do what God has asked me to do? God is stronger, and the same Holy Spirit that's in Jesus, in Solomon, is the same Holy Spirit in you and me. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? Let's pray. 
But Heavenly Father, thank you for this time again together with friends. Thank you for just your word, Lord. Thank you for reminding us so much. So Proverbs is so chunky. It's so much. Each one of these verses, you could spend time teaching and 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 just going through your own life and looking at your own life to make changes, Lord. Thank you, Lord for this message. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, that if we just draw closer to you, that you will give us direction for everything. And Lord, someone that prayed that prayer of salvation, I pray right now they would seek out a church. They would text me or uh, Pastor Freddie or uh, any of our team, Lord, and, and ask for help. Ask for where can I find a good church? What, do I, what Bible do I need? How do I start this relationship with you, Lord? If you're watching this, Lord, people are watching this, they're saying, I'm struggling. I'm just struggling in my own walk. I need encouragement. We want to pray with you. Just text us and we would love to pray with you. And Lord, thank you for those that are doing what you've asked them to do. Thank you for the ones that, are, that have a generous heart, those that are working for you, those that have learned that complaining doesn't get anything done. And just the knowledge of your word is not enough without the action of your word. Thank you for technology. Thank you for getting you back connected on the internet. I ask this in your name. Amen. A few little final reminders. And I thank you for everybody who uh, was very patient uh, with me on the video uh, this uh, this this afternoon. Um, please share this if you would. We need to get the word out. We need to continue to support those. Thank you for all the ministries who do take the time to watch this video. I'm so appreciative um, that you support it by allowing me to be on your Facebook page. And uh, we just want to reach more people for Jesus. Again, the LaborDaySingles.org retreat is coming up. We have people that are registering. Please register the sooner you register the better you'll get options for rooms because the nice hotels always sell out and you'll end up in the bunkhouse unless you don't care you want to be in the bunkhouse so you need to go ahead and get your deposit in um also christmas cruise this december i would love for you to be a part of that singles cruise i uh, got a cruise coming going to alaska in june of 2024 um information is coming also uh, if you need resources on how to start ministry, grow singles ministry, the singlesnetwork.org. And uh, love to come and speak in person or by Zoom at your church. So we just thank you so much. And I uh, look forward to the next time to see everybody. God bless. Take care.